Uh, welcome. I'm Jackie Barton. I'm a chemist from Caltech, and I'm delighted to open this session. Uh, we're going to be talking about everything from robots to geometry to habitable planets. Uh, we're going to begin the session uh, with a joint presentation by Vijay Kumar and Roshna Bachi, uh, two leaders in the field of robotics. Uh, Vijay Kumar is an outstanding roboticist, along with being the Nemirovsky Family Dean of Engineering at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Kumar is well known for his research in the control and coordination of multi-robot formations. In his laboratory, they're creating autonomous flying robots that are able to navigate in complex uh, three-dimensional environments. His group is interested in developing the methodology for the analysis of swarming behavior, uh, both in biology and now uh, in his engineered systems. I know that you're all going to enjoy seeing some of the spectacular videos uh, from his laboratory. Uh, Dr. Kumar uh, is a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Among his many awards, he's the recipient of the 2012 ASME Mechanisms and Robotics Award, a 2013 Popular Mechanics Breakthrough Award, the 2018 uh, Robotics and Automation Pioneer Award, and the 2020 Robotics and Automation Field Award. He was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2013 and the American Philosophical Society in 2018. Along with Professor Kumar, you will hear from Roshna Bachi, also an outstanding uh, roboticist. Uh, she is the NEC Distinguished Professor Emerita of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences at the University of California, Berkeley. She was the founding director of the Center for Information Technology Research in the Interest of Society, Citrus. Uh, she received her master's and PhD degrees in electrical engineering um, from the Slovak Technical University, uh, followed by another PhD in computer science uh, from Stanford. Uh, she was actually the first woman to obtain an electrical engineering PhD in Slovakia. Her research is highly interdisciplinary, involving robotics, artificial intelligence, engineering, and cognitive science. Among her many important contributions, Bachi is very well known for the idea of active perception, where moving sensors allow the robot to gather more information from its surroundings, leading to a streamlining of robotic movement and also a better understanding of human visual perception. Dr. Bocci is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Academy of Medicine, as well as a fellow of the Association for Computing Machinery and the American Association for Artificial Intelligence. She's a recipient of the 2009 Benjamin Franklin Medal for Computer and Cognitive Sciences, the 2013 Robotics and Automation Award, among others. Uh, many others. Uh, Dr. Bachi was elected to the American Philosophical Society in 2005. But now uh, I prefer to turn uh, the podium over to Professor Kumar and Professor Bachi for their presentations. Uh, the presentation is AI, Robotics, and You. Thank you, Jackie. That was a kind introduction. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and it's an even greater pleasure to be sharing the podium with my close friend and collaborator, Rujna Baichi. Uh, this meeting uh, features a presentation which builds on a previous meeting in April when our colleague, Professor Barbara Gross, introduced the history of AI and the challenges in building a system that understands language and visual scenes. And she underscored some of the ethical questions that have arisen with the rapid growth of technology and adoption in society. So in this meeting, we wanna focus on AI and robotics, a focus with, on applications in the physical world, the world that you and I live in, as we move towards a future where robots will be a part of our lives. So today we'll outline some of the history and the basic state of the art in the field, and then look at some of the potential societal challenges as we continue down this path. So let me turn on, uh, share my slides. And as I said before, uh, we will uh, tag team and do the presentation. So broadly speaking, uh, there are four components of technology that are driving robotics and AI. First, computing. 
Today, we can outcompute humans. The human brain has 85 billion neurons, and the fastest supercomputers have 40, 400 trillion transistors. Today, we can outsee humans. We can see the world with an array of interconnected devices, cameras, and other sensors. We can learn to detect, classify, track objects, track actions, and it's really a very powerful technology. From the standpoint of control, we can make decisions on computers in split-second timing and do this autonomously. Again, a superhuman capability. And then finally, communication. And most of you have seen this. Technically, we can achieve infinite bandwidth, reaching anyone, anywhere, at any time. So robotics exploits these four technologies. It's fundamentally about perception, which Ruzhna is the world's expert on. It's about sensing and reasoning about the physical world. And then it's about planning and taking actions in the physical world. And of course, computation is central to this picture. And that's where AI comes in. So I'm gonna hand it over to Arujna. She was one of the few handful of people who were at the starting gate when the field of AI took off and has had over six decades of experience in this field. Rushna? Thank you very much. Um, um, you yes. have to turn on your camera, Rushna. Oh, uh, I tried, but somehow didn't. Okay. There we go, there we okay. go. Okay, thank you. Well, I, um, I am a living history of AI, actually. I've been very fortunate um, in the 60s, 67 actually, I arrived from Czechoslovakia to Stanford uh, at the invitation of John McCarthy. And um, little I knew that actually John McCarthy uh, was one of the four people with three others, Marvin Minsky from MIT, uh, Rochester from IBM Research and Claude Shannon, Bell Labs, who wrote the proposal on artificial intelligence submitted to Advanced Research Project Agency. I actually ask, um, coming from Eastern Europe, where the same ideas were under the cybernet the, the word cybernetics, I said, why did you choose the, the word AI? And he very kind of nonchalantly said, well, the uh, DOD asked me to change, the, the, invent a new name um, so that we distinguish ourselves from the Europeans. So that's the, the, the birth of the AI. The, <clears throat> This was uh, actually the ARPA agency, Advanced Research Project Agency. At that time, didn't have the D in the name. Agency eventually established three artificial intelligence laboratories in the mid 1960s. One at Stanford, one at MIT. And at Stanford was led by John McCarthy, at MIT by Marvin Minsky and one at CMU led by Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. <clears throat> the interesting thing to note that they were, they were different in many, many regards. So CMU effort was different from the other two MIT Stanford labs. The CMU effort was focused modeling the human behavior and particularly um, Alan Newell was very, uh, committed to the behavioral modeling rather than uh, looking at the models of circuitry of the brain or, or, or other aspects of the human intelligence. It was anchored in the ideas exposed in the book by Newell, Shaw, and Simon, general problem solver GPS developed during the time 1952 to 1960, over 10 years. They also demonstrated the first AI program called Logic Theories, LT. Marvin Minsky, educated at Princeton in mathematics, but also in neurology, focused on mathematical and computational approaches to perception 
and particular vision. And there's a famous statement in 60, I believe it was 66 or so, when he said to one of his students, well, computer vision is, one, is a summer project. And here we are many years later, and we are still struggling with computer vision. <clears throat> The intriguing question at that time was how to recognize three-dimensional world from the two-dimensional images that we were obtaining from the two-dimensional cameras. John McCarthy, my advisor from, from the very beginning of the AI in late 60s emphasized that intelligence is all about how we store the perceptual and actual action information so that the agent, human or machine, can carry out given task. Simply put, AI is all about the representation. Representation to him was both symbolic as well as numeric. Towards that goal, he invented a new programming language for information symbolic processing list. Many of you may have heard about that. In fact, there was a early days a company that was trying to make a computer based on this. The operators in the language were both algebraic, but also logical connectors and or and non. This effort enabled the students to represent various chunks of knowledge and the reason on the validity and make causal inferences. This effort find the receptive audience in medical application, games, uh, Samuel, Arthur was at Stanford when I was there and worked first on chess and developed a lot of different techniques of search techniques that today are not, are used on daily basis and also checker, but also reasoning on daily life activities. In the late 60s and early 70s, it became very clear that AI cannot stay only at the level of symbolic representation. See, John really believed that the symbolic representation is a kind of compressed way of information and therefore very suitable for modeling the knowledge in the human brain. <clears throat> But of course, it was became in the 60s, 70s that this was not good enough. But it has to face the agent interaction with the real physical world, hence dealing with perception action in the loop. AI has created extremes of skepticism and, and optimism with this technology can offer to humankind. And I am often asked, you know, what can AI do? And as an, as an inventor, you feel terrible responsibility that all this new technology can be used for good, but as well as for bad. Hence, we have experienced periodic AI springs and winters. This happened in 1974, there was a hype. Then in 1980, was winter, then again 87 hype, and 90 winter, and right now we are in a very optimistic state, but one has to be cautious in our expectations. I should say that it's not obvious to me that the society is giving a proper credit to our hardware colleagues. Because of them, we are able to collect and and store so much and compute so much information. So the first robot um, at Stanford, the AI Center at Stanford Research Institute had the first shaky robot. You've probably seen it somewhere here. <clears throat> um, and uh, under the leadership of Charlie Rosen and Nils Nilsson, they unfortunately were passed away, but also mechanical engineers, Bernie Ross and, and uh, Joe Engelberg, who started the first company called Unimate. Um, they built first experiment in robotics. The experiment has uncovered 
all the difficulties of the perception, action, interaction with the physical world. The problem of perception and action involve not only mathematical physics, but also psychology, neurology, cognitive science, and some other sciences. I, in 1972, when I came to Penn, I started this robotics laboratory, and I argued already at that time that we need to break the barriers between the computer science and engineers, but also neurologists and psychologists and, and, and all these other disciplines. But unfortunately, <laughs> Academia doesn't move very fast, so we still have those barriers. The big milestone over the next three decades, from 1980 to 2010, were so-called grand challenges posed by the engineering community of test how far the robotic technology has advanced and can carry out autonomously hard tasks in the real world environment. I maintain, that building autonomous systems is simpler and easier than have a human robot interaction. There were developments of humanoids. These were robotic systems capable of complex kinematic and dynamic configurations, such as jumping, climbing, stairs, manipulating different objects. There is a whole sequence of these humanoids with various capabilities. I should say that actually Japanese were really at the frontier of this. Then we had a vigorous effort on autonomous driving cars, which is still ongoing. Why? Because you have to deal with interacting with humans and humans are unpredictable. So I give it to Vijay now. Thank you, Rujna. So let me uh, tell you what is exciting today and perhaps the reason for the hype uh, that Rujna alluded to. The biggest transformation we're seeing today is the shift from what I would call the classical model-based methods that have, been, that have been developed over the last three centuries towards the so-called data-driven science and engineering methodologies. So if you were to write software, maybe 30 years ago, the, the traditional, the modus operandi was to use manually designed rules, rules that were based on models to manipulate the input data and produce the required output. So for example, if you were to use cameras to detect fruit on trees, something we do in my lab in an apple orchard, you might say you're looking for round objects, red objects, specular <laughs> objects, with a background of green leaves. So these are rules that allow you to take a set of images and then detect the output, the output in this case being the existence of fruit. However, this approach is not particularly effective if the apple is partially obscured by leaves or if the apple is green, which happens almost always in early in the growing season, or the illumination is not perfect. So if you were to use data-driven approaches, the simplest approach is to say, well, we want to look at a broad set of features. So again, think computer vision, think about the object that you see. Uh, you have high contrast regions, low contrast regions. You have regions of color uh, of different shades. You have edges. And, and so these are all generic features, but then you train the algorithm based on pictures of labeled images to map these features that are detected using rules into output the detected fruit. So this is an example of something that is data-driven. It's driven by machine learning algorithms, but the key is that there's manually labeled data sets. Human beings are labeling fruit for you, which can be a very tedious and time-consuming uh, task. So the buzzword today is deep learning, and deep learning takes this representation that Rujna alluded to, to even more abstract level. It abstracts the process to a point that the manual input to the model and the reliance on the model is completely minimized. So relevant features for fruit detection, for example, are identified automatically by training on labeled data sets. And again, as I said before, it, the key is to rely on accurate labeling by humans and lots and lots of these data sets. So this approach 
has had a huge impact on computer vision. Object detection, and you've probably seen it if you use social media, uh, on Facebook, for example, identification of faces, this is all commoditized now. Why? Because if you have lots and lots of data, you can train these machine learning algorithms to detect objects. Similar approaches work for speech translation. And please note, I'm not talking about understanding either of speech or language, but simply the process of taking speech and translating it to language. So if you have an Alexa or Siri at home, you know that this is also getting commoditized. However, these kinds of approaches have been largely ineffective in the physical world. The physical world is, is qu quite complicated. And I wanna show you this video. Unfortunately, this is the only video I'm gonna be showing you. And this has nothing to do with the work in my lab, but I wanted to argue that today's robots lack the hand-eye coordination of two or three roles. We're far from seeing either model-based or data-driven approaches to realizing uh, the dexterity that you see in this video of this three-year-old child. And why is that? Well, as Rujna mentioned, the uh, problem about reasoning about the environment, uh, a three-dimensional environment and a continuous time is extremely complicated. And the challenge to doing this using data sets, using deep learning is very simple. You need lots and lots of labeled data sets. The collection of these data sets is extremely expensive. So if you wanna go through a thought exercise, let's say you have an algorithm that detects fruit uh, and let's say it has 90% accuracy. If you wanna go from 90% accuracy to 99% accuracy, the answer is we need more data, maybe a hundred times more data. And then perhaps 99% accuracy is not enough. You want to go to 99.9% .9 accuracy. Well, that might require 100 times additional data. So at some point, this process is very difficult to follow. And it's difficult, if not impossible, to eliminate edge cases. Again, think self-driving cars. The only real way to prove that a self-driving car will not drive off the edge of a cliff is to train that self-driving car on lots and lots of data sets of driving off cliffs, which is something we would never do. So that's an edge case, which is really, really hard to learn. So as a result, today's AI, for the most part, is a black box. It's a black box in the sense that it's not guaranteed to be safe. It cannot explain to a human user the action it outputs. And therefore, simply put, it cannot be trusted by society. So if you want AI in the physical world to be safe, explainable, and trustworthy, you have to address four challenges. The first challenge is the challenge of verification. So how do you prove that a system satisfies certain desired formal properties? So let me take an example of a very simple automated system that we're all used to, which is a dishwasher. How do you verify a dishwasher? Well, you put the dishes in, you turn on the on button, and at the end of the day, you see if the dishes are clean or not. Very easy to verify. The second challenge is validation. And the problem in validation is how do you ensure that a system meets its formal specifications and does not have unwanted behaviors or consequences? So if I turn on the dishwasher, I know that the dishwasher is not, go, not going to go chasing around a pet in my living room or clean the carpet by accident. It's, a, it's easy to validate a dishwasher. Security. Uh, how do you ensure that no unauthorized party can manipulate the object that you're trying to design, the software you're trying to design? So can the microwave accidentally turn on my dishwasher? And we know the answer is no, at least today. And then control. How do you ensure that a human being can meaningfully control an AI system after it starts to operate? And the human can say, okay, well, you know what? The way I built that system was wrong. Can I fix it? And you need these three, these four properties to be satisfied before you can say an AI system is safe, explainable, and, and trustworthy. The hardest thing, and again, Rujna alluded to this, is to make sure that a human can have control over an automated system. Um, Captain Sullenberger is uh, well remembered for doing one of the most amazing feats as a pilot, landing a plane on, a hot, on the Hudson River. But the favorite quote I remember when he was interviewed, he said that 
the thing that you're trying to do, which is minimize human effort and intervention, uh, requires automation. But this backfires because automation paradoxically requires a lot more human training. So today's self-driving cars, and again, Tesla's are a great example for that, for a human being to detect that something is going wrong and that they need to take over is extremely hard. More importantly, to design that AI to facilitate that handover is extraordinarily difficult. So just going forward, I wanna point out one other thing, even if you try to fix all of these things, uh, uh, a challenge that arise and continues to get more and more egregious is the one that's very familiar to, to us. So I just chose to collect a few clippings from 100 years of the New York Times. And there's many, many stories about robots and jobs. And today, uh, this is a fact, for every 10,000 human workers, the average number of robots that are being employed around the world is 85, 85 out of 110,000. That number is steadily growing up. And uh, so clearly, the question of what happens to our jobs is an important one. And more recently, the question of what should government do? And this story is getting more and more important as we look at growth of robots across the world. In some sense, the story is not new. Uh, we've seen this in farming. Jobs have been displaced before. 100 years ago, one in three American workers was employed in a farm. Today, less than 2% of the workers are farmers. So we have roughly 200 consumers for every farmer. We don't think twice about this. This change happened over a 100 year period. We adapted to it. Manufacturing changes happened a lot uh, or a shorter time span. So you look at this curve, uh, US output of manufacturing doubled over the last 30 years. That's, this is the blue curve. And it did so with 33% fewer workers. And towards 2008, 2010, we all saw the tension that that caused. And arguably that's one of the reasons that explained the big geopolitical changes, not just in the US, but also around the world and the election of President Trump. Um, today's changes, are even more severe. AI and robotics have a five-year time scale if farming had a 100-year time scale and manufacturing had a 30-year time scale. And we're still struggling with manufacturing, even though the changes happened over a 30-year period. And the question that all of us should ask is, will our untrained society be, be able to adapt to the changes brought on by this technology? So there's a reassuring report, if you believe in McKinsey's studies. So this report concludes with a fairly reassuring conclusion. It says that 5% of occupations consist of activities that can be 100% automated. Well, 5% is a small number. And it goes on to say, well, less than 30% of occupations consist of activities that can be 60% automated. But it's clear that some jobs will be displaced occupations will decline, and possibly new occupations will be created. And this is all fine if you're prepared for the creation of a new occupation that is yet to be known, not yet to be defined. So the question we all should ask is, when all of this is happening, how will we be prepared for this rapid change? So let me just conclude by making three observations. First, as both Ruzhan and I pointed out, there are many exaggerated claims about AI and robotics. And I always say that the future is further away than you might think. For example, with self-driving cars, the first self-driving car was built in 1987, 34 years later, we're still not close to perfecting this technology. But the second observation is more troubling. There's a lot of irrational exuberance. This is leading to big investments and the development of technology innovative technology, but with unexpected consequences. So as innovators, what's our responsibility to be responsible to society? And are we innovating responsibly? And I would argue no. And then finally, I would just say that robotics and AI will have a significant impact on all of us. And that's why we titled this presentation, AI, Robots, and You. And the broadest, broadest question is, are we prepared for a society where human beings and robots coexist with lots of AI in the mix? 
Thank you all for listening. And Rujna and I would be happy to take questions or comments uh, from you as we prepare for the second part of this discussion, which will happen hopefully live in April of 2022. Thank you, Vijay and uh, Rushna. Uh, that was terrific. I'm already getting a couple of questions. Uh, first, uh, Richard Garwin, uh, it's, I think it's more of a statement, exciting and informative presentation by two movers and shakers in the AI robotics field. It seems that pairing machine learning with dynamic modeling of the system can provide numerous artificial experiences on which to train uh, machine learning. Uh, and this is clearly used in developing self-driving cars. Um, I have a, a, a piece of that question actually to add. Um, you know, when you started uh, your presentation asking this question in part, when will robots be part of our lives? Uh, when will autonomous vehicles also be part of our lives? Huh. Well, let, let me try to say something and then probably BJ will have something to say as well. <clears throat> let me just say that for the last 10 years, I produced several students to work on them. And um, the problem is at this point that <clears throat> because you deal, whether you like it or not, you deal with other humans on the road. So you, you enter terribly unexpected situations. We understand how to model physics, um, control, you name it, decision-making. If we can limit this, the environment to a certain limit, if, if our differential equations have boundary, well-defined boundary, we can deal with it. That's why I said autonomy is relatively easy, providing that you have properly spelled out boundary conditions. When you deal with people, you don't have that. That's why I'm saying that we as engineers, we have to work with neuroscientists and psychologists and whatever other these scientific endeavors are out there because we have to somehow learn about this unpredictability. And yet, think about it, about the, the deep learning. They will tell you, the students will come to me and say, look, Ma, I can classify 99%. And my answer is, how would you like to fly in a plane that you know that out of 100 times, one will always crash. That's the 99% accuracy. So that is the issue. And we have to be honest and about the limitations. Okay. So if I, if I can just add to that, I think uh, in, in some sense, uh, the self-driving car technology works today. If you are to limit, as Rujna said, the complexity of the environment. So I'm sure we all remember the very first time we tried to drive a car, it was likely in an empty parking lot with no other obstacles. And if the obstacles were there, they were all fixed obstacles. Well, today's self-driving car technology can easily negotiate that level of complexity. Um, in fact, if you've driven some of the new cars, they come in built in with lane following and being able to follow vehicles and arguably with a level of reliability better than humans. Most of us have a uh, between 80 to 200 millisecond reaction time. You know, we see the car slowing down, you slam the brakes, and that could be, that, that is pretty long. And, uh, and robot cars can, uh, can, can uh, respond at a, at a, in a fraction of a millisecond. Um, I'm in San Francisco where today Waymo cars are being tested. So you, if you go out on the roads in San Francisco, and uh, you know, San Francisco is a city with lots of unpredictable things. Uh, yes, they're testing it, but there's always a human driver behind the wheel. And, um, and I think that human driver's job is a lot more difficult than for you or me to get into a manually driven car, stick shift car in San Francisco. So uh, these things are happening. I, I wouldn't 
say that we're ready for this technology in exactly. the kinds of environments that that we we imagine. Um, so, for example, go to Naples, Italy, or go to Mumbai, India. I mean, the chances of deploying self-driving cars in those environments during my lifetime is close to zero, I believe. Jacqueline, think about it with this new infrastructure that is coming, hopefully. You can imagine certain roads designated only for autonomous cars and no other human can drive there. Then you can guarantee a certain certain performance. And um, just like you have tall, tall roads, this would be a limited. So that's what I meant by boundary. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, there are a lot of questions here. Let me just ask uh, one more, uh, which was from Barbara Gross. Um, thanks for a wonderful presentation, especially for mentioning the challenges of autonomous systems working with people. Question, uh, do you see a need for the data dependent approaches, i.e. Uh, deep learning, to coordinate in some bit, in some way with symbolic methods. I think if I may take a stab at this, this is also not unrelated to the question that Richard Garwin asked. I think uh, there's a wealth of information uh, that we have from first principles, um, models that we can build. And, and of course, data-driven methods has a place. And to me, one of the big challenges in this decade is to figure out how to bring these seemingly disparate technologies together. Um, so to learn from scratch based on data is not the right answer. Um, so uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier, it feels like computer vision, the data-driven approaches have seen a lot more success. But when you're controlling an object, interacting with the physical world, and today you look at self-driving cars, a lot of it is model-based. And so when these things come together, uh, I, I do think we'll have more powerful machines. Um, and I, I, I'm sure uh, this, this bringing these methods together also plays a role in perception, in speech, in, in, in understanding scenes and interpreting the physical world. Can, can, can I say just two Please. more sentences? Yeah. The symbolic representation is in some ways a compression, okay, of the data. And uh, the problem we have here is, yes, there are symbolic uh, procedures, as I mentioned, and John McCarthy was one of the big uh, proponents of this, that you can take these semantic symbolic representations and reason over them. But then when you come and use them to interface with the physical world, then you have to have a mechanism of going back and forth from the symbolic into the physical interpretation. You know, what is white? What is green? You know, those things, the, the, the labels have different data representation and that connection when you deal with the physical world, when you just reason on them, it's okay. But when you deal with the physical world, it's a different story. Thank you both. Uh, this is fascinating. And there are a lot more questions, but I think we have to go on. Uh, so thank you again.